Thank you very much, Lorraine. And thank you uh, so much for those um, introductions to our project centers that are um, on site and, and have been developing over many years. And uh, we will now move to the panel discussion portion of our presentation. As you know, we have two panels this evening and our format will be to conduct each panel and then to take questions from the audience at the end of the second panel. So if you can ask your questions in the Q&A box as we go, these will be saved for the very end and then we'll have the um, discussion opened up to all panelists to answer the Q&A. So our first panel is titled Engaging Diverse Partners in Oceania, Indigeneity, Community and WPI Students. And I'd like to thank our panelists um, so much for being here this evening. I appreciate that you've all made time in your busy schedules and um, so many of our um, panelists are very busy people. So thank you again for taking the time to talk about our partnership. I guess the way I'd like to start, I, I think we can um, change from this slide to uh, the Zoom view of our panelists for panel one. And um, panelists who are on this panel, if you could unmute uh, your microphone and um, turn on your camera, it will bring you to the foreground. So our students have been very fortunate to have partners from a wide range of university, community and governmental organizations. And I'd like to start with a few minutes for each of you to introduce yourselves and um, for each to tell us a little bit about the context of your own work outside of our collaborations. So let me start with um, Maria Bard. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ngā mahi tuatahi, ki ngā tangata whenua o ia wahi, o ngā tangata whenua e mātaki taki ana, uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, ngā maunga whakahirehira, uh, kua hui hui mai nei, uh, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Um, kia ora everybody, I'm Maria Baj, I'm from Te Arawa and Ngāti Awa, which are um, tribes in the area of, Bay, uh, the Bay of Plenty area of New Zealand. Um, and I'm also an academic at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, so living in Wellington, away from my area. Um, well, I don't know where to begin really, Ingrid, in terms of things outside of the projects. The, the projects, and I'm thrilled to see Paige here, who um, I haven't seen for some, some years, um, but uh, a lot of our work um, with, with the WPI students is connected with our, um, our tribal activities and academic activities. These tend to merge together. Um, a lot of the research that I do is um, for my own um, tribal groups, if you like. Um, and in fact, most recently, uh, the project on uh, predator-free Aotearoa, so the, the government here has a predator-free strategy, um, that's that's I've been dragged into that uh, for the hapu, for my sub tribe as well. Um, my background's actually political science and studying elections and um, looking at renewable energy. That was also something uh, my tribe wanted me to look at because of how we can generate our own electricity. And maybe Paige will talk about um, what that led to um, in terms of a micro hydro to generate electricity. So um, yeah, political science, um, resource management. Um, these are all uh, the sorts of things. Um, that I do. So, tēnā rā koutou. Thank you so much. That's an amazing accomplishment, all of those things. I extra now appreciate the fact that you've made time to be on our panel today. So thank you very much, Maria. Um, Paige, since you were mentioned uh, just now, why, why not uh, say a little bit about yourself and how you came to be on this panel and again, what you're doing um, outside of your uh, former time at WPI? Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here and see you all and see Maria. Um, it's, you know, definitely uh, was a formative experience. Um, I completed two projects in New Zealand. Um, so I graduated in 2017. I completed my IQP in 2016 and went back um, for my MQP in 2017. 
Um, so I can't believe it's been that long, um, but definitely has de shaped um, my career choices since then. Um, I went on to grad school down the road at Clark University studying international development and social change, and I um, concentrated in climate change impacts and adaptation. Um, and from there, I uh, started a, at a, uh, as a program manager at a local um, ocean conservation nonprofit that works with the sailing and boating community. So I study a lot of plastic pollution issues. So um, yeah, definitely environmentally focused, um, really thankful for my time studying in New Zealand and, and learning there. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's about me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paige. And uh, Ross Smith, if we could go to you next. Thank you for joining. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, <clears throat> um, e, e te tangata whenua, uh, uh, kei te mihi ki a koutou. Um, I've, um, I uh, was an English and um, a mathematics teacher in high school. Um, and then my mum asked me to come home and help in the research of uh, for a treaty claim for our, our iwi or our tribe. Our tribe is uh, mainly on the um, North Island's east coast um, uh, towards uh, Wellington. Um, and I'm an iwi um, uh, environmental manager. Uh, so our tribe's environmental manager. And um, I've been called into some things in terms of... Um, a national ministry for the environment in terms of um, water um, and contaminant accounting and uh, thinking about our process in terms of that. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thank you so much, Ra. And finally, um, Amy Meehan, please introduce yourself and a little bit about the work you do outside of your WPI um, project work. Sure. Oh. Uh, so yama um, and kiora and hello. Um, I suppose first of all, I just I think it's important for me to acknowledge my ancestors and custodians of the land I'm on today, which is the land of the Wanarua country where I live and work, um, the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai where I was born and raised, and the ancestors, um, my ancestors, the Gumaro country and island, um, and I thank them for their democracy, uh, not only of people. Uh, the arts that hold our sciences and the totem systems and much more despite unresolved sovereignty. Um, I suppose my um, background is uh, Gumaru, obviously, uh, and just to put that in a, in a nas um, national and perhaps international context, um, the Gumaru Nation is currently uh, fighting to protect a really large forest, the Pilliga, um, in northern northwest New South Wales from gas. Uh, which is being developed up there. Uh, but I suppose what I'm trying to do uh, down here is, is partly support them, um, partly uh, culturally educate people, which is why I'm so pleased to see WPI having a global school. Um, but I suppose my uh, main uh, occupation is actually developing uh, ways of sequestering carbon and hydrogen in ways that are culturally understandable and have perhaps been disconnected or lost in uh, dominant culture. Um, so I suppose uh, the connection to WPI is we did a biochar project uh, with Beyond Zero Emissions, who I volunteer with uh, at the end of last year with some mechanical engineering students. Thank you so much, Amy, and, and also nice to meet you for the first time here. So I would like to, um, I would like to address the work that you've done with students, but before I get to that, since you all are working with um, community in the domains of community engagement, um, I think it would be interesting to hear some of the key challenges that Maori and Indigenous Australians are facing with communities and governments now in 2021 and what your priorities are looking forward to the future in your work? It's a big question, I know you can, <laughs> we can start to talk about it maybe just a little bit. I think we'll circle back to it in time, but just in general, how is it? I'm not sure who you want to start, but um, 
Um, kia ora, Amy. Um, you were talking about the climate change related activities. Um, so clearly climate change is a big issue for us all, possibly the, the biggest, um, bigger than COVID um, that we're facing. So for us, um, you know, how we transition um, in a just and um, correct kind of way to a, a zero carbon um, political economy is a, is a pressing issue for us nationally. Um, but associated with that, I guess there are so many other elements in terms of how we how we increase a kind of electrification of our society, but then how we generate uh, electricity in a renewable and sustainable ways, how we continue to con continue to produce our food locally and also in regenerative <laughs> and sustainable ways, um, and how we protect our, our native species and promote biodiversity as a place to um, not just mitigate against climate change, but also help with community resilience and reconnecting um, to the environment as part of our spiritual health and just our sort of general well-being. I guess there's so many elements that interconnect and across all of those um, for Māori, it's uh, the kind of ongoing um, uh, struggle, I guess, to have our rights and interests um, that were guaranteed or reaffirmed in Te Tiriti or Waitangi 1840 um, have those reflected in our constitutional arrangements. So that's a kind of ongoing challenge. But there are so many opportunities, I think, as well. And those are the exciting elements. There's quite an, a momentum building um, with lots of different community groups who now see that perhaps the, the current um, dominant economic and political models that we have are, you know, destroying the planet and destroying our well-being as people and destroying our connections um, with um, non-humans and so you know the current model not really working and I think there's a growing momentum of people who want to look at a circular economy a regenerative um, economy um, organics and so on and I think that the key opportunity for us is um, walking with those people um, and joining our, um, our, our organizations and our groups um, in some sorts of alliances to keep that momentum going so that we see that shift occur at our different levels of governance um, and really transform our, our society. Thank you. And I'll just give uh, Ra and Amy a chance to, or maybe Amy at the moment, a chance to jump in on that answer. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I, um, it comes down to culture for me um, because culture actually led to the use of fossil fuels and it's interesting to think about how that happened. But not only that, to find that when we realised that that was not going to be okay, what the mechanisms are in different societies to, um, to actually stop and change the culture and um, I suppose the challenge I has come to, into the front of my mind since my work last year particularly is even though I'm working on a science problem, uh, it's, it's actually particularly in Australia and I, I have to pay my respects to, um, you know, my, my neighbours and the custodians and ancestors there because we don't have a treaty here in Australia and it is a fantastic example across the water of the collaboration and it's still a fight. It doesn't, you know, I, I acknowledge what Maria says, it doesn't solve things. You still have to fight uh, for what is good for the land, what is good for the people uh, and fit all the pieces, in, those complex pieces in. Um, but I find that because there isn't cultural awareness as a standard thing in schools, that the primary job of, um, well, not primary job necessarily, but a big job for Indigenous people in different disciplines is to first educate their colleagues about where they're coming from. And that can take a long time. And preferably, it starts pre-kindergarten um, for people. But we're now having to play catch up in Australia because we, we just do not have the basis to spring into um, a diversified culture it's very much a, um, a dominant culture so even though this is supposedly a science problem I see it as a culture and science problem. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora. Yeah, I'd like to carry on from the diversified um, kind of thinking so one of our problems here is to move from 
uh, where everyone thinks that they, uh, there's a diversity and you're really a fruit salad, but the fruit salad is dominated by pineapple. Have you ever had that kind of fruit salad? And so you have a kind of a, you pick up a piece of pear and it still tastes like the textures of pear, but, or an apple, but it tastes like fruit, it tastes like pineapple. And rather than having that type of diversity, think that we should have a mosaic type of diversity where each piece of the whole is appreciated for its color, for its texture, for its size, and for its shape. And then um, each piece is able to contribute with integrity. And so um, one of the things that we, that we struggle with in terms of the communication and weaving of people is when we um, have a whole lot of um, for biophysical data um, that um, perhaps if we're looking for a, for example, a water consciousness across everybody in the community, we really need to be thinking about behavioural change data. And so data that's going to bring behaviour change as opposed to data that's explaining the what. Uh, we really need to explain the why. And um, uh, so some of the narratives uh, that we can weave, um, it, it can be explaining the why a whole lot more. And um, it needs to be, don't get me wrong, we need to be built on strong science knowledge in order to make the narrative so that we're not, you know, set up on a pack of cards that's going to tumble at any time. It needs to be a solid foundation. But when we're communicating and bringing the community and weaving the community, we need to be thinking about um, uh, the message that we're giving and uh, um, enabling behavioural change. And um, having put people buy into that behaviour change in terms of the narrative. And uh, it's, that's not about manipulation. It's about putting things fairly. So recently, in terms of um, our conversation about COVID, we've had some real good uh, um, uh, communications in New Zealand in terms of an emergency. But when we look at the climate emergency, we don't have the same kind of communication. And so we really need to have a communication uh, that's built on solid foundation, but is, is involving people, asking them to be a part of the collective consciousness. And so um, a, a lot of what we want to do as Māori is, yes, we need to explain our piece of the mosaic, but we want to also sh show that our piece of the mosaic is an asset. And, um, and, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we get involved in uh, people who want to apologise for not including us earlier. And so then we become a piece of the apologist puzzle as opposed to a piece of a, 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 a puzzle that's an asset. And, you know, one of the real assets in New Zealand is that um, our native trees have gone through an evolution that's, a, that's allowed a balance. Um, uh, the exotic trees have uh, have been in a part of an intervention, and so there's not a balance there. And that, that's been proven so many times that it's you know um, not really worth going through. That it, what, what's worth going through is what's the asset that our native trees, our indigenous, our endemic trees, um, and our indigenous flora and fauna are, are to the whole of the environment. Amy, I'm wondering if, if this resonates with you as well for um, Australia. Absolutely, um, because the flora and fauna that were here um, when we were colonised is the best adapted. Um, it's the best adapted of everything. And um, I suppose over hundreds of years, the natural democracy overseas gave way to centralised democracy and there was also a lot of um, academic work that went into raising uh, where humans are in the scheme of things. And so, you know, we've got some great scholars here, um, uh, Tyson Younger porter and Bruce Pascoe um, and, and what Ra said about, you know, our, our native um, flora and fauna is... I suppose the acknowledgement that has become custom in Australia is because it's not otherwise necessarily being acknowledged. And the acknowledgement is still small. It's just something at the beginning of, of some gatherings. But if we acknowledge, if we start eating 
um, again, these foods uh, that were, you know, that easily, well, mostly easily grow here, except when climate change starts to infringe. Um, but that we, we have indigeneity around. And, and can I also acknowledge here our migrant cultures who are minorities face quite a lot of the same problems. So I'm not going to make this totally about indigeneity. I have to mention that. It's about the dominant culture not acknowledging the values um, that, that we're here, the, the systems that we're here, and not even acknowledging the flora and fauna and medicines and all of that sort of thing that we're here. But it's not about necessarily making it bad because we're part of a system that makes it invisible. So it's not necessarily our fault um, that, that was, that's even kind of being done to Indigenous peoples to, um, to fall within a system that has been long overdue for reform. So, but that doesn't mean there's not still responsibility there to, um, to have that cultural awareness. And the benefit of that cultural awareness is that it connects you with all of that, that flora, that fauna, that appreciation and the possibilities, the universities of knowledge mm -hmm. um, that, that exist. Right, that's right. So, I mean, this work that, that you're all so strongly engaged with, um, combined with um, science communication, but also with indigenous knowledge systems and, and putting this into the conversation, um, is this making it to the national level? Is this part of the national conversation as well? Or do you still um, find that it's, um, it's not really there yet? Um, is that for me or okay, sure anybody like yeah, any, any of you sure go ahead uh, okay I'll jump in um, I really again admire New Zealand's um, uh, equalizing of 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 Māori voices um, I'd say that it's occasionally part of the conversation here we um, uh, Indigenous Australia and, for, you know, we're all getting better at speaking up when things are not okay on television, when things are said that are offensive or are discussed without our culture there where we're jumping up and down and we have our, you know, our NAIDOC weeks and our anniversaries of the apology and things, but it's not equalised on, on our national broadcaster um, so much yet and I'm hoping that there are, there are greater steps that can change and, um, you know, there are examples all over the world but we have a fantastic example of, of putting the Indigenous name next to, to the, the colonised name and, and saying, hey, we're here too. Yeah. Thank you. I want to I want to talk about this for another three hours, but um, I also want to bring Paige into the conversation. And Paige is here as a student who participated um, not just with her IQP, but another um, involved project called the MQP uh, several years ago at the New Zealand Project Center. So I want to bring in a student's perspective and a little bit about the relationship between um, some of you who have sponsored projects and our students who come from the US. So um, Paige and Maria, maybe if you could just uh, chat a little bit about um, the project, just very briefly um, what the project was about and Paige, maybe a bit about the, um, what it meant to you now looking back at the experience you had in New Zealand working with Maria. Sure, so yeah, um, we worked on a project with Maria um, at her hapu and uh, outside of Rotorua. And it was on, basically, that was such a unique problem. I thought it was so interesting having a, you know, going for a degree in mechanical engineering. They had already started producing their own electricity and they had too much of it. Um, so they were, um, they had installed a micro hydroelectric unit um, that produced energy from their river and, um, and, from, you know, it was producing an excess, it was powering, you know, as much as they needed to, to power their, their school and the community. Um, and so our task was to kind of determine the feasibility of using that power to um, power a, 
a hydroponic greenhouse um, that would allow them to grow their own food. So um, it was a really unique challenge um, to kind of see all the different facets that go into, you know, community perspectives, gathering what people want to see done with this electricity, how we involve um, all of that. And it's definitely, you know, kind of shaped how I have, you know, chosen my career path and everything like that. I don't know if you want to jump in, Ria, on, on anything else about the project. Yeah, oh, just to say, just um, for your information page, so our, our, you know, Ricky began a little native plant nursery down there in that spare paddock. This is next to the marae, which is our um, cultural meeting place. Um, anyway, so, um, he's now passed away, unfortunately, but the native plant nursery has expanded um, and we're now, you know, eco-sourcing seeds from our mountain bush area, which is sort of up the road a little bit. And then uh, for those of you who don't know the area, um, and then growing them at that native plant nursery. When Paige was with us, yeah, we had high hopes of maybe we could have some sort of um, glass house that we could use the electricity for. In the end, we just didn't have any capital, like we have no money at all. Um, so what was what was feasible was some getting some bits of wood um, and, and building a native plant nursery. Um, with a little shelter and so on. Um, but when Paige and her team were originally with us, um, you know, they went into town in Rotorua. They were um, at one stage staying in town um, there. And I was quite, um, I guess I was quite cautious about their safety. Um, Rotorua is a place that... Um, um, it does have lots of tourists there, um, but it also has some areas where there's quite significant um, socioeconomic deprivation, you could say. There's a lot of poverty um, in the area, lots of Māori people in that kind of category. Um, and so their team were, were going out at night. <laughs> and so I was quite worried about them. But I was, I was uh, you know, um, and then they wanted to do interviews with people on the street. And I just thought of some of my relations um, who live there and, and wondered how, um, you know, how they would feel about being approached by, you know, for Americans to be asking questions on, on behalf of our, our tribal entity. So I was a bit nervous for them, but they received such an amazing reception. People answered their questions, went back and were chatting away to them. They went out at night and they even did some busking and earned some money. <laughs> You know, so there was kind of amazing uh, things that happened during their, their time. And we were really grateful for the research that they conducted, such a diverse um, team. There was geothermal um, in our area as well. And um, one of the parts of their study was interviewing um, the people who own a, um, a glass house, which um, grows gerberas, you know, flowers. And our, our hapu was thinking, well, we, we don't really have much of a need for flowers, but we do have a need for food. <laughs> so how could we convert that? So they were looking at some of the economics there. Um, and then they also interviewed up, up the road, there's a luxury lodge, which is built on some of our land that um, really we felt had come into their hand, you know, into the luxury lodges, lodges ownership via slightly dubious means. But anyway, they <laughs> went along and interviewed the folks there and again, received a really positive um, um, response and I think that was partly the attitude that I've seen of the, the, the WPI students that we've had are really open um, as I think Mike said really good listeners um, and just engaging with other people um, and uh, yeah that that brought them great success and we learned all sorts of things that um, you know, the luxury lodge had never told us, and we're their, we're their indigenous neighbours, <laughs> and so we were quite thrilled to find out all the little things that they were up to, um, that, you know, so that built relationships uh, as well, which was was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was, it was just such a fun project, and um, the second year I went back for our, our senior project, we um, were, had the, you know, the privilege to stay at the, you know, on the you know, at the Hapu and um, it's really, it's, you know, I don't know, out in the country, as you would say, like, it's really, it's, it was so special to be out there and be with the nature and just like be disconnected from everything else and just take the time to slow down and take everything in and, you know, swim in the freezing cold swimming hole and think about, you know, this river that we were working on and also just like be in it as well. And it was just, it was such a special time and I'm really appreciative of that. And it gave me a really good sense of, you know, how, we can um, 
you know, connect with nature and, you know, coming back to the U S I think was like really hard for me because every, it was such a special experience and coming back to this like fast pace, like everybody's just trying to grind it out and, and work super hard. And you forget about that natural connection that we depend on for our life and for our livelihood and for our food. And, um, it was a really great perspective to gain and to have that connection there. And, um, definitely something that inspired me to, to continue with my education, um, and, you know, go the route that I went, like I didn't go the typical engineering route. I never, you know, sat and, and did modeling or anything like typical engineering after, after that experience, I was like, just so taken aback by, you know, engaging the community and learning from, you know, indigenous voices and, and really, you know, kind of leveraging in the environment to, to be a driver and why decisions are made. And um, yeah, so now that I work as a program manager for an ocean conservation organization, um, it really is like it plays into my work every day like um, we work with part of one of the biggest parts of my job is um, basically you know working with um so we work with um, the racing community the sailing racing community so we work with regattas um, that are around the world and a lot of times in New Zealand which is super fun for me because you know I just you know I love um, seeing their perspectives and oftentimes the New Zealand regattas are the ones doing the most outstanding job with our programs and, and running what we call clean regattas um, and so we we um, as I was saying, part of my job is to, you know, collect those stories from these regattas that happen around the world and how they're making these events more sustainable and protecting their playground and, you know, having zero waste events and, and figuring out how you can sail and have these huge on the water events without creating the waste that comes, that so often comes along with having these huge scale events. So um, it's definitely been um, a form of ex experience. All the community outreach that I did as part of this project has been a huge, you know, experience for, and I apply it every day in, in my work now. And um, yeah, it's just been, it's just been awesome to kind of, to go a different direction with all this, you know, coming from an engineering tech school to, you know, still gain all these skills that allow me to do work in different areas. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to just pause for a second to give Ra a last word because I know he has to duck out. Um, Ra's working with a group of students at the moment on a pretty nuanced project. And um, I just want to appreciate that time you're spending with them. I know it's, it's uh, challenging to nurture a team that is just getting into a topic and uh, you're just in the midst of it right now. Are you still there, Ra? Uh, kia ora, so yeah, oh, 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 that's far too close. Um, Kia ora everyone. I, I, I would just like to say um, thank you to WPI in terms of wetlands um, in our um, uh, policies, our national policy statement for freshwater management. We've just picked up something called essential fresh waters um, that um, uh, valued uh, wetlands for, for their scarcity. And uh, we want to move that in, in among Māori from wetlands uh, being important for the scarcity to wetlands being uh, important for their ecosystem services and their ecosystem health uh, opportunities. Um, and while ecosystems are important, um, uh, we've got a whakatauki that says there's something more important than that and it's people. And one of the things about our, our wetlands is, and um, in Māori we call them the repo, uh, so the uh, uh, repo uh, um, can be important for um, uh, human health. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to find from um, our ancient medicinal uh, plants is uh, some things, uh, some cures for uh, for today's population. And so, uh, in one a plant called manuka, um, it's got the fastest healing of cuts in terms of its property um, uh, that makes things speed up. And uh, we're, we're thankful for a contract that's gone to the States in terms of uh, the army taking on our bandages with manuka oil on it so they can cure the cuts faster. Um, but there's a, sometimes um, we might get a bit of evangelical in terms of the environment and in terms of um, some of the social things and in terms of some of our cultural aspirations would, and which are all important um, but we kind of reject the thinking about economic opportunities uh, to try and be um, 
um, Tuturu and Māori are, are authentic about what we want to do. Um, and I, um, one of the things from our home is that we have been traders in the past. And um, if there's some way that we can do that responsibly, as opposed to profit gouging or maximising profit at the expense of the environment, if we can do those things in the balance, um, then, you know, there's uh, some opportunity for our whānau as well in terms of that. And so while it's not um, number one like it might be with other things, it's a consideration. And actually over those four things is um, uh, something that we can move from indigeneity to humanity and so that there's a, um, other uh, people in our communities that see... Um, a value in uh, well-beings that are economic well-beings, that are environmental well-beings, that are cultural well-beings, and that are social well-beings. And that actually, if we give them the opportunity, and one of the opportunities we're finding is that people were in New Zealand, if we turn to the environment, uh, we might just find ourselves in the environment and find each other, and that might be the way that we weep. So that's a, a little bit about our whenua. Whenua uh, means uh, earth, but it also means a placenta. And so in both, of those op in both of those spaces, a seed gets to turn, a baby gets to turn uh, before they, they come and face the world. And that's uh, a little bit about perhaps where we are looking to turn to face the world, the world of our environment. So kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, love working with the WPI students and uh, with your, um, uh, how can we say, we say in Māori, uh, your ahua or the way that you are. And so uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, Ra, and thank you for the time you spend with our students. Um, I know Ra has to scoot out uh, for the rest of our panellists. Again, I wish we had three times the amount of time to discuss this further and in more depth, but um, I just really want to appreciate all of you for working so closely with our students, um, the countless hours and weeks, your patience, um, your advice, and all the teaching you do with our students that profoundly have an impact on them, which is what we see with um, just, you know, our favorite example here tonight, Paige who took a sharp turn from, uh, Paige, what was your original major? I forget. <laughs> I did complete a major in mechanical engineering. Okay. Did I use it? Not a day. <laughs> okay. Well, not in the, not, you know, not in the typical sense, but yeah. But you've used it to make, you know, a really significant contribution. And um, sure. so anyway, thank you very much everybody for being on this panel. We're going to move on to panel number two. Um, and there'll be time for Q&A at the end of that panel that will refer back to both panels. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn the controls over to Steve McCauley who will moderate the panel on climate resilience and sustainability.